Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. So hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Dr. Michaela Gabriel, and I'm a fellow researcher here at the Wakanas Institute for Indigenous Health and one of the many branches of the Ontario NEAR. Um, and I'd like to start us off in a good way. I will be our host today, but um, just before we begin and I introduce our new wonderful speaker for today's session, I'd just like to do a very brief spiritual opening. I'm just gonna light my medicines over here and I invite you to do the same from wherever you may be joining us from. And I'd just like to take a moment, a very precious moment to acknowledge the, the four directions, <clears throat> all those beautiful doorways that um, guide us in our work and that bring us great teachings, great medicines, and, um, and great teachers along our journeys. Um, I'd like to thank, say a big chini guesh to um, the great spirit that has um, brought all of us to this point that brings us forward in a good way. Um, and I'd like to give great great thanks and support for everyone joining us. I hope I'm sending um, great warmth, great love and, and all sorts of goodness to you wherever you may be. So I'm just gonna offer all that, all that good medicine to everyone. So chi mi Um. So, and I'm just gonna pass this along to my, uh, my handy co-host Roy. He's off screen, but he's here. Okay, so I'd like to get started. I, I can't um, wait any further to introduce our next wonderful speaker, Dr. Christopher Mushquash. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about him. So Dr. Mushquash is a Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Mental Health and Addiction and Professor in the Department of Psychology at Lakehead University and the Division of Human Sciences at the Northern Ontario School of Medicine University. He's also a Vice President Research at the Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences Center and Chief Scientist at the Thunder Bay Regional Health Research Institute. He is the Director of the Center for Rural and Northern uh, Health Research at Lakehead University and uh, in addition to his many academic appointments, Dr. Mushquash is a registered clinical psychologist providing assessment, intervention, and consultation services for First Nations children, adolescents, and adults at Diliko Anishinaabek Family Care. Dr. Mushquash is a member for Pace Platform, is a member of Pace Platform First Nation. So thank you, Dr. Mushquash, for taking some time out of your very busy schedule to join us here today. And without further ado, I think I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much. <clears throat> I appreciate the opening and, um, and thank you for offering all the uh, offering those medicines um, um, you know, you know, on our behalf. Um, very, very nice to be here. It's, a, it's an honor and certainly a privilege uh, to be able to talk about um, the, the, the things that we do together. Um, I see a, a long list of attendees, 35 people, and I'm scrolling looking for people who I know I see a few familiar names, uh, which is always very, very nice. And then I uh, a lot of names uh, who who uh, who I've yet to meet, but look forward to meeting at some point. Um, <clears throat> um, so uh, just just to begin, I want to also say I, I'm hoping I, I see a, quite a quite a, a terrible storm uh, pass through uh, part of the province um, uh, over the weekend. So I hope everyone was okay and uh, your loved ones and communities are uh, are okay. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about some work. Um, program of research that's been embedded within a community partner organization, an Indigenous community partner organization, for oh, about nine or ten years. Um, and uh, just as a bit of an example uh, as to how, uh, how, how community-based and community-directed um, uh, mental health research can be sort of embedded in, 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 and rolled out in a way that involves uh, teams of uh, trainees, uh, but also community members and, um, and uh, community leadership. So in the inter introduction, there was a lot of different roles that were described that, that I have. I, um, I'm, I'm originally from Northwestern Ontario, a town called Sulacout. Um, it's about four hours northwest of, of Thunder Bay. Um, so I'm in Thunder Bay right now. Um, this is the uh, territory of, uh, of, the, of the, the people of Fort William First Nation, um, who are part of the larger Robinson Superior Treaty area on the North Shore of Lake Superior, which includes a whole number of uh, um, First Nation communities, including my own uh, community, and I'll show you a map uh, shortly um, in a moment. So um, I was fortunate uh, uh, in, in terms of um, um, finding my way through the university system uh, with, with some mentors, with some people who uh, were able to kind of um, support uh, the, the work that I was doing and support uh, 
the kinds of uh, opportunities to to help me, um, you know, sort of find a place. Uh, I certainly have to say that uh, when I was uh, growing up, um, these types of uh, appointments, uh, university professors and psychologists and directors and vice presidents and Canada research chairs weren't something that I was familiar with at all. Um, I, I, I still don't really know what any of those are, uh, even though I'm, I'm sort of, um, you know, doing, do, doing, doing some, some of those jobs. Um, but I think the one thing is, is that um, as I reflect on and, 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 and I'm frequently asked about how I found myself doing the things that I'm doing, certainly it, uh, it all boils, boils uh, it all comes back to um, uh, things that I learned um, on the land and certainly things I learned um, culturally. Um, and if people are interested in that you know, story, I can, can share that uh, at, at some point. I think this is a story largely about partnership though today. And here's a map uh, that just demonstrates uh, some of the communities that we've partnered with. So this is the Robinson Superior Treaty area, largely. Um, and there's a Thunder Bay is here and Fort William First Nation is here. So this is where I am today. I'm presuming you can see uh, my, my cursor moving over top. Uh, and if you travel along the uh, um, um, Trans-Canada Highway, you'll go past Nipigon and Red Rock Indian Man. And if you travel for another, you know, 45 minutes past there, you'll get into Pace Platte First Nation, which is right on the highway. Uh, right on the North Shore at the mouth of the Pace Plant River. So that's my um, my First Nation. Uh, the, the town I grew up in is sort of like probably over off the screen somewhere northwest of Thunder Bay, uh, about 45 minutes north of the trans Canada Highway. So quite a rural, a rural town. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, how our partnership started. So I'm a, I'm a clinical psychologist. And when I returned back uh, to Thunder Bay, I did my my training, um, well, I did an undergraduate degree and a master's degree at uh, Lakehead University. And uh, somewhere around my, I start off in biochemistry, somewhere around my second or third year undergrad, I spend a lot of time thinking about what types of skills might be useful to, to learn about uh, as a means of being helpful to um, my community. And uh, I sort of grew up um, recognizing and, and observing, you know, uh, difficulties in mental health, difficulties in addiction, um, and, and wanted to learn more about that. So um, I enjoyed bench science. I certainly enjoyed chemistry. In fact, <laughs> I, uh, one of my favorite courses I ever took as an undergraduate was called Tree Development and Function, and it's all about trees. And uh, I, I sometimes joke that I was either going to be a plant biologist or a psychologist, and um, we, we know how that, how that story ended. But um, somewhere around my second or third year, I took some some elective courses. Uh, I took philosophy and I took English and I took uh, psychology and, and really found uh, 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 that, you know, psychology had a, a good mix of, of the things that I was interested in right from sort of, you know, broader population level um, um, things that, that can influence mental health and addiction down to individual level things. Um, it had, uh, it had neuroscience and biology embedded, but it had research embedded as well. And I, I got really interested in that. And uh, somewhere around my third or fourth year undergrad, I, I found a posting for a research assistant job and I, um, and I applied. I had no idea what I was doing, but I applied and I interviewed and, uh, and I got the assistant research, research assistant job. And it was at the Center for Rural and Northern Health Research. And at that point, it was uh, under the direction of, uh, of uh, uh, Dr. Bruce Menor, who's, who's since passed, sadly, and, uh, and also Dr. Mary Ellen Hill. Um, who were doing a lot of community engaged uh, research uh, in collaboration with um, um, others uh, in the north, including uh, you know lifelong mentors like you know Minkat um, and, uh, and, and many others I, I could name, um, who who really helped socialize me and, and, and enculturate me and, and, and help me understand uh, you know community embedded research, uh, indigenous uh, health research, uh, rural uh, and remote. Northern research, and in particular, the value, of, not the value, the importance of, of, you know, strong relationships and following, um, you know, community direction and community priority. Um, so that was my, my early introduction to research. And, and then I went to Dalhousie University and worked with uh, um, Sherry Stewart and Patrick McGraw 
uh, but also worked closely in my first couple of years with uh, another researcher called Nancy Camo and uh, folks up in uh, Escazoni and uh, Member Two and uh, Indian Brook um, in Nova Scotia, uh, who, uh, who who taught me a lot as well. Fred Wien was another one um, who taught me a lot. And I had the opportunity as well to visit communities there and talk about um, you know uh, challenges that they were experiencing, but importantly looking at uh, potential uh, pathways to, to help solve some of the things that they were contending with. In those years, I had you know, the, the opportunity to meet you know, uh, Merdina and Albert Marshall. You know, Merdina has since passed. You'll, you'll, you'll know that their names from, from the two I've seen model that's, uh, that's, that's um, been, been very, very influential in, in terms of thinking about, um, thinking about uh, 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 Indigenous uh, re uh, research. My story with them always uh, involves uh, 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 fish chowder that they gave me. I don't eat fish, but of course, when you're invited into an elder's home, you eat whatever, whatever is given to you. And uh, I was very grateful to be invited there to be able to speak with them and learn from them. Um, and I, I ate fish chowder. Um, and, and apparently it was very, very good fish chowder, but I, that, that part was probably lost on me, unfortunately, at the time. Um, and then I went to Winnipeg in the College of Medicine there and did a residency that, that had me in uh, Winnipeg uh, for uh, half a year and Flin Flon, Manitoba for half a year. Uh, you know, about an hour north of Winnipeg, it's, uh, it gets pretty rural and uh, it gets very friendly. It says so in the license plate and I noticed that it gets very, very friendly. I have lifelong friends in Flin Flon, certainly. But throughout my dissertation research, I was able to partner with um, schools in Winnipeg, but as well First Nations out in Saskatchewan. So I really had a lot of opportunity to, to travel to different places and learn from a lot of people. So all that to say, when I returned to Thunder Bay and, and began, um, you know, um, reconnecting with a lot of the community uh, uh, that I that I had been away from, I actually uh, reconnected with an organization I'd worked for as a as an undergraduate student, um, and I, I, I joined in a new role, and that was as a as a well, first as a supervised uh, practice psychologist, and then as an autonomous psychologist, and uh, really, uh, you know engaged in a lot of conversation and a lot of, um, um, you know, just listening about uh, different priorities within the agency. So the agency is mandated for mental health and addiction, health, and also child welfare. It's governed by uh, the leadership of 13 First Nation communities. So uh, chief counsel and or delegate um, as, as the board of the organization. Um, there's, there's a leadership structure. Um, cultural values are embedded within the the work that, uh, that the organization undertakes, and really, it's to um, to try and find the very best pathways and, 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 and health and wellness for Anishinaabeg, um, you know, children, families, and communities in, in Northwest Ontario. Um, fortunately, as well, embedded within the university, uh, I've been very, very lucky, lucky to have uh, a lot of um, very, very intelligent, uh, motivated, and bright uh, graduate trainees. Uh, who were, were interested in Indigenous health. I, I um, you know, when I was a graduate student, uh, there were, there was a lot of uh, work being done nationally, uh, right, right from, you know, the inception of, of CIHR and, and the Institute of Aboriginal People's Health as it were, was at the time, uh, under the directions of, of people, including some people who I see on the call here, you know, so back in those days, uh, certainly, um, uh, Dr. Jeff Redding was around, and Dr. Malcolm King, but Dr. Rod McCormick was, was super busy there, um, Dr. Earl Nowgizik, super uh, involved at those times, and, and they had a network, um, you know, similar to this one, that I was able to participate in and learn from, uh, from all of these, uh, all of these people who were just so embedded and so, um, and working so hard to um, develop, um, you know, develop out the Indigenous health research never and, and set it aside as, as, as something that required uh, unique uh, and, and, and sort of culture-based uh, community focus uh, beyond the other institutes. Um, you know, I, I like to think that, you know, that work was, you know, so uh, influential and, and so foundational to the direction that CIHR later took, took with, you know, stress, the strategy for patient-oriented care, for example, um, or sorry, strategy for patient-oriented research, you know, the idea that the people who, um, people and citizens as, 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 as participants, as, as um, not just participants, but as leaders and, and, and those who direct the, the research endeavor, you know, that was foundational in early, uh, early uh, IAPH. So, you know, again, 
um, really uh, learned a lot from, from, from many of those individuals and found myself in, in a faculty appointment with, with you know, very bright uh, graduate students who, um, who are you know, an ab absolute privilege to work with. Um, and I do see now such an interest in, in, in graduate trainees uh, in Indigenous health, so much interest, um, you know, so far beyond, um, you know, those early days when we seem to feel as though we, we may have been a relatively small group, but certainly that group has grown and, and you know, as, as evidenced by 40 people here today, for example, I mean, this is pretty remarkable. Um, it used to be that, you know, we would go to meetings and, um, and there would be some people in the room we didn't know, but there would be a lot of people in the room we did. And, and now it seems as though that's, uh, that's changed a little bit. And I'm, I'm certainly um, hopeful. The, um, the team here uh, includes a few people now who who finished their um, PhDs uh, and a couple more will be finishing shortly. Uh, and it's growing as well. I have a, a new trainee um, who's joining me in September who I'm really looking forward to welcome uh, to our program. So essentially what happened was, you know, because the mandate of the organization is so broad, there's all these questions that come up. And one of them was, you know, when, when uh, a child, when a family needs to be supported often through a kinship arrangement, that is the child sort of, you know, is, is moved in with a relative uh, for the time being to help support the parents in terms of uh, any needs they might have with respect to mental health, addiction, housing, those types of things. Um, you know, how do we know when the child, when the family is, is sort of ready to be to begin that process of coming back together? Um, and, you know, this was a question that, that leadership in the communities was, was curious about. They had had their, you know, experiences um, navigating this and they, they, uh, they wanted to ask in a more structured way, you know, how to go about doing this. But also they were quite curious as to, um, you know, how can we measure, um, you know, children's readiness from a cultural perspective as well. Um, so the, these were the sort of one of the early series of, of projects we put together. And um, um, the, this first one was a, was, a, uh, was a master's thesis, actually. And, uh, and uh, Dr. Elaine Toombs now is a, is a clinical psychologist within the organization that we work at, uh, but also a, 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 a CIHR Banting uh, PDF postdoctoral fellow in my laboratory who continues to do a tremendous amount of Indigenous community-engaged work. Um, so really trying to improve current service delivery models and create some evidence-based strategies. And I use the word evidence here, not in a way that includes uh, cultural and community knowledge, because from my perspective, that's evidence. Um, identified uh, a number of priority areas that were related to reunification, parenting, identify successes and barriers to reunification, but also to examine different service needs. So from a participant perspective, and this was a qualitative study, uh, participants really identified the need to place children with extended family or within home communities to facilitate the best outcomes. That is that um, continuity of, of cultural attachment to attachment to place uh, and, to, and to people, um, which I think is something that we're very, very familiar with uh, in, our, in our communities um, as, as a priority. Um, certainly improving parental and community capacity was being uh, very, very important when it, when it comes to promoting those positive reunifications. So ensuring that parents have what they need, communities have what they need. Um, some of the successes that we identified were, were you know, available supports. Um, so really leveraging, you know, what was available in community um, in order to wrap around families. Um, but in particular, those that increased empowerment and community capacity. So, you know, oftentimes when, um, when people, um, um, interface with systems, there is a lack, there is a, an undermining, let's say, of people's, uh, there can be an undermining of people's sort of sense of agency, um, sense of self-efficacy, uh, et cetera. Um, and within our communities, that's, that's sort of been a, a, a long-standing imposition, right? So uh, all the way from residential school through, um, through um, child welfare um, um, uh, imposition through the uh, 60s and, and into the 90s, uh, before um, before communities uh, began to again take uh, take over the, the local child welfare services, uh, a lot of that undermining um, you know is, has has long lasting effects as well. I mean, it's it's very difficult to feel as though you're able to do something from a place of strength when systems that have been imposed have been um, working very diligently to undermine uh, not only capacity and knowledge that you might have, but certainly the the, the, the feeling that you also have 
um, that that capacity knowledge if you need to be able to succeed. Um, so, you know, things that increase empowerment were very, very important as well as community capacity. That is, you know, we not just directing intervention, directing the supports and resources at individuals, but rather, you know, the more that we can uh, build out robust communities, um, the better that communities are able to support uh, those within. A number of uh, ba uh, barriers that were identified included things like lack of culturally, parenting, uh, culturally appropriate parenting services, some hesitancy to, to obtain available support due to, due to fears uh, of child welfare intervention. So, you know, there are services and supports in adjacent communities uh, that are available, but I think sometimes in our communities, the experience uh, of people are that, or have been that, you know, if, uh, so for example, if you engage with another social services agency or you engage with a program offered through a school or something else that, that sometimes, you know, a child welfare referral might come in for, you know, for some reason that, you know, that, that wasn't what you were expecting from the, from this, from the, from the program. Um, so again, uh, those fears um, are, are grounded in, you know, historic reality and experiences that people have had and can sometimes make people feel um, uh, somewhat reluctant again to, to kind of put themselves in a position where they have non-Indigenous um, sort of eyes looking in and, and scrutinizing um, what might be um, you know, um, happening in their family or their home. Uh, and then just the nature of mental health difficulties of community members were all, was also seen as a, as a barrier. So that, that the acuity or chronicity, severity of, of need um, was, was, you know, in some cases quite significant and, and very, very difficult to kind of, you know, mitigate. Um, that project was also embedded in a wider project that looked at uh, developing a well-being measure um, so this, uh, again, is in peer review uh, right now, but uh, we, um, we, we actually, uh, in addition to those uh, interviews about reunification, we asked people to um, describe uh, how you, you know, from a cultural perspective, how you would know when, when children are, are doing well. And, um, and what happened was uh, we, we, we utilized those interviews to develop a whole range of, uh, of, of items. Uh, the idea was to develop a bit of a checklist or a bit of a, a paper pencil measure. Um, we, we, through two mental health intake workers, we uh, administered the pilot version of this uh, to caregivers and parents of 91 kids. Uh, they also received a child adolescent needs and strengths measure. So this is a, a mainstream measure that's, um, that's used at intake and follow up uh, within, our, within a lot of child mental health agencies in the province. Um, and then after piloting, we interviewed mental health intake workers. We refined uh, measures. Uh, we did some, um, um, some, some analyses on, on, on the measure that uh, basically uh, demonstrated a few different factors that emerged. So one factor that we called general well-being, one that, one, that, one that included traditional activities, and one that was more around social engagement. And this represented one of the few measures that was created and validated for specific use within First Nations people, particularly in Northwest Ontario, but, but more broadly as well. And that measure, you know, would, continues to be used um, um, within the agency now, and, uh, and has been expanded beyond to other partner agencies who were interested too, and who found the measure uh, relevant. So again, this this program of research was meant to help the agency. This part of the program to help the agency be responsive to leadership and community priorities, um, to, uh, to to and, and to improve services and service provision uh, and planning. Uh, in those, in those areas. I talked about the child adolescent needs and strengths measure. So, you know, oftentimes we say, you know, you hear the expression in, uh, for, among Indigenous communities that we are sort of data rich, but information poor. That is, we, we, there's a ton of data about us. There's a ton of data everywhere, all the way from, you know, federal to provincial to local to community to, you know, there, there's, there's ton of, tons of data being collected all the time, but we almost never look at any of it. Um, so, you know, it, and it can be very, very difficult to access it, and there's a lot of considerations uh, needed to, to appropriately, appropriately analyze it, and who governs those data, and you don't have to, you know, spend a lot of time on, on those. Um, but, but needless to say, um, you know, the, the, the data that are collected, um, you know, could potentially also be of benefit uh, if, if we have access to those data and if we have access to people who can help organize and, 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 and analyze the data and report back on uh, you know, what's happening. 
So we, we looked at this within the agency. The, the CANS is a, is a measure that's administered to you know, all, of the, all the kids um, um, who, are, who come into the agency in the mental health side. It's an interview from an intake worker uh, to a caregiver. Um, and what we, what we thought was, well, let's, let's see you know, where, where, the, where the need is. Let's see you know, what, what's being reported, and then perhaps we can develop some services and supports in those areas. So the most commonly reported mental health intervention needs were seen for anxiety, mood difficulties, uh, difficulties with emotional control, and adjustment to trauma, which was quite consistent with observations from within the organization and certainly within the, uh, the, the mental health workers and the caregivers. You know, oftentimes, um, you know, the kids uh, are having some pretty significant difficulties in these areas. The, the, the challenge is, is that then they get, you know, waitlisted to see a counselor. So we began thinking about, um, you know, if there's perhaps another process issue that could, could address uh, um, common things um, a little more quickly without having to be placed on a wait list. And I'll get to that in a minute. Also within the organization, we've got a number of culturally adapted um, mainstream, let's call them, um, um, uh, evidence-based uh, uh, programs for a range of things. So the Stop Now and Plan uh, program is a well-established early intervention for kids with conduct or oppositional related behaviors. Uh, and this is a, a proportion of kids. So you saw in the last one, emotional control adjustment to trauma that can often present clinically as kids who um, have a lot of difficulty you know, managing impulses, uh, have a lot of difficulty with aggression and, and things like that. It comes from a place of, you know, of, um, well, that's a, that's a whole other conversation, but, um, but need, needless to say, we, we, we service uh, a, a lot of young people who have, you know, who present with these types of clinical difficulties. So the Stop Now Plan program uh, actually has um, um, kind of two components. One is sort of the work that, that happens with, with the kids, sort of in a group-based format, and then it has a caregiver uh, group-based format as well. And then there's coaching and practicing that happens uh, with respect to the skills. Uh, it's rarely been evaluated, evaluated with Indigenous youth, although there's been some evaluation, and certainly it's never been adapted, it had, had been adapted specifically for First Nations. So we tested a culturally and contextually uh, adapted version, and we saw significant improvements in parenting self-efficacy, um, particularly in the domains of control, uh, ability to, to appropriately discipline, uh, boundary setting, um, and, and, and for, for, for these specific age groups, and it's, um, I believe it's a 6 to 12 kind of intervention. Um, we also saw significant uh, decreases in externalizing symptoms. So those would be sort of, you know, impulsivity and um, aggressive uh, behaviors, et cetera. Uh, and uh, improvements in overall sort of reported symptoms. So again, you know, looking at those programs that we do have, rather than just having them run, uh, you know, where there are data being collected, really looking to see, you know, how they're doing. We've got a number of ongoing projects. Um, so one of our projects, and this is, uh, this was, uh, Dr. Tim's, uh, PhD. It's also going to be featured Dr. Lund's, Lund's PhD. She's just finished her clinical residency now. She's already defended. Um, you know, we, again, we have an addiction treatment center on reserve and, uh, um, community leadership, you know, was quite curious about, um, you know, trauma and, and the experience of, of, of people, um, seeking residential treatment. When it came to uh, trauma and as well uh, intergenerational trauma, so we uh, we began looking at uh, at this and, and this project project was ongoing. We also looked at a few other kind of clinical areas that that you know might um, be let's say a little less subject to um, cultural bias. And, and, um, so you know there are a number of different behaviors, a number of different kind of functions that uh, that. Uh, might be more characteristic of, of all people rather than, um, you know, selecting clinical targets that are, um, let's say, normed or um, validated on non-Indigenous populations. So what we did was looked at uh, a couple of different areas, including ACEs. So we looked at general health. Uh, we also looked at, um, you know, what are generally termed as um, executive function. And I can talk about that if people have questions as well. Um, we also uh, asked people to report on what they knew about uh, their families, so either their parents or their grandparents, to get a sense of that intergenerational question as well. So not only reporting on adverse childhood experiences, um, uh, but also reporting on 
upon that with which that that which they know from their family. We set this study up very very carefully, very very careful collaboration with the treatment center, um, clinicians and leadership. So what happens is is that there's questions that that you know people answer on intake, um, uh, and then there's questions that they would answer, and then that's gen for general program participation, you know age you know, where are you from, family, you know, those types of demographics and some other kind of clinical questions, you know, what, what types of difficulties are you, you know, are you looking for support from, are you interested in culture, you know, approach, cultural approaches, etc. Um, and then we also asked uh, at the first point, just a, a lot of health questions, you know, do you, you know, have you, do you have any health difficulties that you're experiencing, you know, how long have you had those for, etc. We don't actually ask any questions about trauma or any other mental health symptoms until after that time, and it's usually around two or two and a half weeks uh, after people have been uh, at treatment, they've then established relationships with the treatment staff, with the cultural supports, with each other. And it's that point in the treatment where they're actually addressing um, trauma. Uh, so what we wanted to do was be really thoughtful about how we organized you know, the data collection endeavor to ensure that we weren't you know, um, uh, inadvertently um, putting anyone in any you know, unnecessary sort of situations where they might be, um, you know, um, surprised or triggered by, uh, by, by questions about trauma. And um, we, we haven't had any, any, uh, any uh, you know, really notable difficulties with this. Um, the other thing that we did was we've um, also uh, uh, provide some individual um, tailored feedback to people in terms of um, uh, some, some, uh, some of the, the, the variables. So, you know, when it comes to how they're doing with respect to, um, um, you know, some of the mood related and, 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 and sort of personality related type uh, ideas or, or constructs, sorry, we provide a little bit of individualized feedback to them. And then the other thing that we developed was an ACEs group where we give a larger sort of psychoeducation about uh, the nature of adverse childhood experiences, uh, the effects that that can have on people's mental health uh, and, and addiction. Um, and uh, as well as some, some strategies for helping to, to, to move forward uh, when we experience difficulties like that. And the second part, again, was looking at executive function. Um, again, I don't have to get into the details of this, just needless to say that um, it's an area that is really underexplored, but certainly an area that clinically has a lot of um, uh, utility. So, you know, people would say, you know, patients would say, you know, I have a lot of heart, I have a lot of difficulty controlling my emotions. I have a lot of, you know, difficulty um, controlling my impulses when, when I, I feel like I need to do something or if someone you know, says something to me or you know, I have a hard time not reacting or I have a difficult time you know, sort of keeping a plan or organizing my life in a way that you know, allows me to get the things done that I'd like to get done. And all those can be seen as uh, consequences of early exposure to trauma. Oftentimes they're diagnosed as mental health uh, difficulties like you know, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or something. Um, when, when in reality, uh, you know, what we're probably talking about is, um, is sort of disruption in, in executive function is a consequence of sort of uh, disruptions in, uh, in attachment and, and, uh, and experiences of trauma. And there's, you know, we've, we've published a number of papers on this, um, which I'm happy to talk about if people are interested, but I know we're not psychology, not, not as specifically a psychology group here, so I'll keep moving. And then we've got a number of projects that are certainly in development. Uh, Lauren um, Delacandro is a PhD student uh, in my laboratory. Um, again, her, her research is embedded within the treatment center. Um, and it's really looking at different um, factors that, that contribute to success in terms of the group cohesion in, in, the, in the treatment process. So one of the things that sometimes happens is that, you know, when 22 people or 20, 20 or 22 people come together, it goes really, really well. Everybody sort of gets along. Things, you know, are supported. People make friendships. They support each other outside of treatment. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't go that way. And sometimes it, it can go. It can go such that there's a lot of conflict. Uh, people leave treatment before completing due, due to some of the conflict. Um, and this, these are observations. If anyone's ever kind of worked or or um, collaborated within a within a, a residential treatment center. This is sort of what, what can happen sometimes. And, and so we were asking, so community and leadership and, and leadership at the treatment center were asking, well, could we look at this? Could we look at, you know, what are some factors that help um, contribute to sort of a, a more successful cohesive experience for, 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 for patients, for clients? And, and what are some of the factors that don't? 
And if we know that, then perhaps, you know, when people are coming into treatment, we can kind of mitigate them or we can, we can help support people who, you know, uh, might be feeling, you know, how this, um, um, you know, just in the context of, of trying to make a more successful experience for people. Um, so that's ongoing. Trent Lyons, he's joined the lab in the last uh, year, uh, last two years. He's, uh, he's a Mi'kmaq student from Nova Scotia, very, very happy to have, have Trent on the team. Um, he's looking at, I talked about the child adolescent needs and strengths. He's really interested in cultural and protective factors as, as, as they relate to academic outcomes of young people. So uh, in sport, so, you know, in the cans, there's data, there's all sorts of data, but there's also data on, you know, cultural involvement, uh, um, certainly, uh, you know, sort of the nature of understanding of culture in, in, the, in, the, in the family, but also um, academic achievement. So he's looking at those data. Abby Radford is a, is a Métis. Uh, graduate student in my lab, uh, also you know, great, to, great, great addition, um, and she's interested in the treatment center data, uh, in particular looking at um, different predictors of, of substance use difficulty. Um, so I talked a little bit about personality constructs. So my, my own dissertation was was um, you know related to understanding how uh, personality constructs uh, in young people can lead to or, or can can it can sometimes increase risk when it comes to uh, to substance use outcomes, and uh, certainly this is uh, you know well validated in, in child and, uh, and adult literatures uh, across across cultural groups uh, and ethnic groups, um, but but not a lot of work's been done looking specifically at, at how can we address these types of difficulties for you know indigenous adults. So this is what Abby's doing, and then Lydia is a, a new grad student as well, and. Uh, she was previously doing a PhD in cognitive science at, at Waterloo and, and, and shifted to clinical uh, and joined our laboratory. And she's also great. And she's really interested in, um, in the nature of trauma uh, uh, substance use and you know, what might be more broadly termed you know, uh, suicide related behaviors. Some people you know, have uh, very difficult experiences and, and tend to um, um, have a lot of difficulty with, with thoughts and feelings. And again, you know, um, there's, there's people that are doing, you know, important work in this, um, conceptually, there's per people doing, you know, important work in this practically. Um, but our, our, our partners are really curious about how to support in the very best way, the people that we see in Northwestern Ontario. So we're doing some, some work in this uh, area as well. Um, and I should say too, um, Christie's master's thesis, uh, the, the, the initial kind of look at, at what the presenting difficulties were for the young people, uh, we've got a, a CHR grant and we're developing a, a group-based treatment that, that, that um, uh, takes the very best of what we know for culture-based approaches, uh, but also psychological approaches to help manage some of those difficulties. And the idea is, is we can put together a group-based treatment that um, all kids could, um, could participate in if they wanted. Um, you know, prior to engaging in one-on-one, uh, -on -one, uh, more traditional type counseling, so that they could all sort of develop a, a skill set when it comes to helping to uh, to manage some of the difficulties that they may be experiencing. And that way, there wouldn't be as much of a wait time before they, you know, sort of had a referral to mental health. But then, um, I got to see somebody, uh, got to see a clinician, and again, working closely with cultural supports within the agency to to have cultural skills built in. Uh, that pro project, as you can imagine, has been a little slowed down uh, due to COVID, um, um, uh, because it's only been recently that we're, you know, back to bringing people into a room together. So that that's ongoing. And then I should say for the ACES project as well, we've got a five-year CIHR project grant to continue that data collection and, and, and continue looking at the data and looking at how to how to best understand and best improve um, services and supports for people who are accessing uh, those services. So in summary. You know, this is an example of um, just one example from, from, from you know, um, our, our, our territory where we've embedded um, graduate trainees uh, in, in a community-based um, sort of evaluation and research framework that's driven by community priorities, uh, that's uh, guided by uh, an, 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 an agency research advisory um, that understands that um, there's a great, tremendous amount of interest from trainees in terms of helping to support. Um, and, uh, and trainees also have to complete master's thesis and dissertations, which is also a tremendous amount of, um, uh, of, of human resource, uh, very, very high quality, very, very engaged, very smart human resource uh, who, who, who are interested in learning or interested in improving outcomes 
um, for, for our, our communities. Um, it's, it's mixed methods, um, and it, it's really you know aimed at answering practical questions, improving that knowledge to practice gap. We're not we're not kind of poking around on theoretical things. We're really um, aimed at um, clear clinical questions, and and and, and, and the reason is is we want to continually be improving the services that uh, that people get in our in our region. So with that, I'll say, uh, Shani Bridge to everybody, um, in particular our community partners, um, and uh, again those trainees. It's the greatest privilege, uh, you know, in, in my work to, to to work with trainees. Um, you know, what good luck you get to sit in a room with with really bright people who like to talk about you know challenging ideas, and you just get to do it as part of your work. It's uh, it's hard to beat that. So uh, to be able to do that while connecting with community, to see the vetting uh, cultural um, interventions and cultural knowledge within you know broader uh, uh, mental health and addiction treatment services, and to do that in your home territory, uh, yeah, I, I couldn't I couldn't have got any luckier. I don't think so. Um, yeah, she neglected everyone for uh, for listening to me. Miigwech. Thank you so much. That was so comprehensive and detailed and such a pleasure to hear about all the amazing work you're doing. Um, and even your even your slides and your details were so intact because we have very few questions in the chat. Um, so if anyone has any remaining questions, please get them in now. We'll be more than happy to take them in the time we have remaining. Um, we do have two notes that were posed. Um, one is from another attendee saying, not a question, but I I appreciate how Dr. Christopher Mushbosh talks about his trainees on his team with kindness and respect. So that's lovely and glowing that that uh, sweetness and kindness comes through um, even in the presentation. Um, how is, what is it like for you in terms of um, overall supervising with the next generation of, in, of Indigenous and non-Indigenous researchers? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Thanks. Um, you know, so I'll tell a quick story. Um, when you're when you're when you try to keep your, your 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 teachings in mind, then the world will show you things at times that that are really informative. Uh, let's say, so about six years ago, um, I, you know, we, we had a son, and uh, I was off for a week, and um, the, my very next clinical day, I saw a, a, a grandmother who she was a year younger than me at the time, and she had just become a grandmother. In fact, her daughter and uh, Sorry, her grand, uh, her grandson, her daughter, and her grandson. So her grandson was born in the hospital, probably around the same time as my son. He may have been there at the same time, although I, I, I don't recall seeing them. But um, in any case, she was a year younger than me, uh, but we had the same birth month. Of course, I had her, her information in front, and she was really happy. You know, she was she she had been sober for about nine months. She she experienced a tremendous amount of violence and trauma. And she was doing well and she was very committed to her daughter and she was very committed to her new grandson and it was really really nice um and uh and the and the the, the daughter was uh, in her middle teenage years um and and the, and the boy unfortunately he 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 was born um with with neo, neonatal abstinence syndrome. so so young, young mother had had an opioid use disorder and she was she was working on that and and they were they were there um they, they were there um you know, getting help. And it, it kind of occurred to me, you know, from a seven generations perspective, and it's not going to be me that sees this through because unless we support this grandmother and support this mother and support this little, little fellow, um, in 30 years on my very last day of work, it might be him who's in the, in the office with me. Right. So, you know, it, it's never that I was so arrogant, that I thought I was going to you know, see it through. I know that things take time and, um, uh, but, but it kind of helped, um, reorient me toward, um, toward the importance and, and, and just, you know, the, maybe, maybe it's the trainees that'll see it through. Maybe it's like, you know, maybe it's, you know, the indigenous and non-indigenous trainees who, the, who, who one day they'll go into work and say, hey, good news, uh, there's no patients anymore. And, and it'll be them who see it through and, 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 that, and that'll be good. So I think that that's the big thing with, with the trainees um, that, um, you know, you can't go wrong supporting them with everything you have because it's, uh, they're just so, so, such important people. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Well, I see Rod's asking a question. Oh, yeah. we got some more. We got some more questions. This is exciting. And thank you for sharing that wonderful, that wonderful story, that wonderful memory. I think that's very powerful. I think it's also very important that we keep these teachings with us 
to work in the community to keep us grounded and to also share um, with, uh, with the researchers of the future. Okay, so um, there is a comment. Someone was wondering if you would be open to receiving additional questions or correspondence following this webinar. I believe in one of your last slides, there might've been some contact details. Oh yeah, oh yeah, totally. Um, oh, I see that. Um, yeah, correspondence is a bit tough because I, I get so much email I can't keep up, but send me an email. And you know, I can even we can even chat for half an hour. Like it's easier just to find a, a time to chat and happy, happy to do that. So yeah. Lovely. Okay. Now Dr. Rod McCormick asked, Chris, if you could do it all over again, what would you do differently? Um that's a good question, Rod. I, I I'd have to spend a lot of time thinking about it. There's a lot of things probably. I think that um the, the road's a the road's a tricky one. Uh, it's, it's certainly bumpy through uh, through academia. Um, um, there's yeah, there's yeah, there's a lot of things that I mean, you know, it's always a balance of of, of that 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 bias that that you get with time, right? Where you know you learn more now, and and you kind of look at things that you've done in the past and go, um, you know, maybe I. Um, Maybe I would have done that different, but at the time you were only working with what you knew at the time, right? So, you know, it, it's always in balancing sort of compassion for who you used to be, and compassion for, you know, and, and with with the understanding of who you are now. So, in that sense, it's a bit of a non-answer. I apologize for that, but I, I think the other piece is is sort of, you know, with with the experience of, of and, and passing of time and, and and you know engagement of and just learning from people. Um, you sort of realize that you're never really making it a, a decision for yourself like you think you are, but you're making a decision for your, yourself tomorrow and yourself next year and, and 60 year old you too. And, uh, and you all, it always feels like it's a decision for now, but it's not really a decision for now. And again, it's that seven gens kind of um, lesson that, that, you know, if you can kind of avoid the scramble of, of how life feels at the moment and, and kind of have that ability to sit back and, and realize that this thing that I'm doing right now is is for me yes but it's you know it's a decision I'm trying to make but it's also a decision I have to live with later um, you know that's a, that's a tricky thing but I'd, I'd love to sit down with you and uh, and talk with you about sort of those things because I, I imagine that you know those things change over time as well and it could be a benefit to um, graduate students even you know you know more junior trainees when it comes to doing all this. Wonderful, thank you. That is a big question. It's a powerful question. Well, yeah, yeah. And for context, I've known Rod for a long, long time, and I would consider him like one of one of one of my academic mentors as well. I've learned a lot from participating on things with Rod. Yeah. That's wonderful. Speaking of uh, of new trainees and uh, upcoming researchers, we actually have two in the chat asking very similar questions, um, but in different aspects. So, with the time remaining, we're going to try and juggle both if we can. Um, so the first one um, is a uh, student finishing their PhD. Vanessa, this is your question, um, and I'm going to try and trim it down just in the sake of uh, of time. And she was wondering if you can comment on how you trained um, people to work in clinical environments with blended culturally safe care. I wonder if you could chat about that for a bit. Sorry, I was kind of half reading. So, so, so the, yeah, the question maybe, is, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that, that's a great question. And I, I see it as sort of like central to, to the work that, that I try and do. And that is, you know, um, hospitals have translation services, let's say, right. So they've got, you know, our, our hospital does. So for example, if you're, from Northwest Ontario and you come here and you speak um, Anishinaabemowin or Cree or Ojibwe or, or whatever, um, and you have difficulty navigating the hospital, uh, you can speak to um, um, translators who, who help you with that. Um, well, similarly, you know, when Indigenous people um, are trained within academic settings or clinical settings, um, they learn a language and, um, and, but they also still have the language of their home. And, and I'm using language sort of, um, sort of broadly here. So for example, in my work, I think you know, a lot about um, what are the active ingredients? What are the mechanisms of action in, in, in evidence-based psychological treatment? Um, and how, how does that relate to cultural approaches? So for example, you know, I talked about emotional regulation difficulties really briefly. 
So, you know, there may not be an Ojibwe word for emotion regulation. There may not be a specific, um, you know, uh, term that means that the same way. There's certainly expressions that I've been told that kind of capture those ideas. Um, but, but, the, but, the, but the understanding of the importance of managing your emotional state um, in such a way as to ensure that you're being informed by your emotions, but your emotions aren't necessarily making decisions on your behalf uh, is, is very, very embedded within a lot of the work we do. In fact, our opening today was meant to do that. So even though you know, the, the opening has a lot of things, you know, symbolic, uh, metaphoric, but also um, then the spiritual, um, it also has a deep understanding of, of the importance of, of centering oneself, let's say, uh, in a place where they're able to go forward and do things in a good way. And, and we actually use that, that expression. Um, and I think, you know, you think of a smudge, you know, I, if, if, you, if you go to a, to a DBT, you know, a dialectical behavior therapy skills workbook, you can look up, you know, a whole bunch of different emotion regulation skills and they're great. I can't think of a better one than a smudge ceremony. If you think of a cultural intervention that can, can you can feel a hair on your neck stand up, um, you know, when, when you're, when you're having difficulty and, and our elders, our cultural people use those, those types of interventions, quote unquote, all of the time, they have a deep and profound understanding of, 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 of the, of the emotional, uh, mental, uh, physical, spiritual conditions. Uh, and they know how to, to intervene, you know, using that again, um, in a Western sense, in a way that, um, is, uh, is embedded within relationship and time and place. So, you know, a lot of the, the blending work, I really think, you know, there's, there's indigenous clinicians, there's indigenous uh, um, researchers, et cetera, um, who, 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 who can understand, who can think through the underlying mechanisms and really allow those different ways of knowing to, to, to communicate with each other. And in doing so, being able to unlock a lot of cultural knowledge uh, and cultural practices into healthcare more broadly. Um, and certainly, you know, where, where, where people run into difficulties, where people don't, valid, val, uh, don't, don't feel that Indigenous knowledge might be as valid, when you have the ability to explain, you know, what's going on in those ways, people come away with a new appreciation of it and go, oh, okay, well, I didn't really know that's what's happening there. And, you know, on one hand, it's because they've never asked, but on the other hand, it, it might be because, um, you know, we need more translators. We need more people who can um, who can kind of put those those ideas together. Um, yeah. So that's, uh, thank you for that. That's a, that's a very good question. Thank you for that. That was a that was um, a beautiful question. I think in in captures so much of the the challenges of working in multiple worlds and working in different systems and needing different aspects of language to join us in both. So thank you very much. Now it is just one o'clock, and I know there are still. Um, some questions that we haven't been able to get to, um, but hopefully um, there's some, there's lots of wonderful uh, medicine that's been shared even in the questions that we were able to get to. So I'd like to thank I, everyone I, for- um, I can, so, Sorry to interrupt, I can say too that I, I do have time. If there are people that have to leave, they can. And if, if there's people that want to stay, then, then that's, that's okay as well. A few minutes. Okay, we'll add in a few minutes then. Sure. Um, okay, so the the one of the remaining questions is actually quite similar, but just in a different branch. So um, Michael Brown had asked in the, uh, the at first he said miigwech, and he was asking how have you been able to, or in what ways have you been able to include ceremony in your research? Did you find that this was difficult, and how so? Um, I I think early on it, it seemed it seemed difficult because I think like. Um, again, like there's been a lot of work in, in these, in these areas, like, so uh, in, you know, that, 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 that people who come along now, uh, we have the benefit of that, that we didn't have to fight that fight. Um, and then there are things that we continue to kind of advocate for and push, push, push forward, um, that, that require change. I remember like super practical, annoying, concrete examples, right? Like it used to be that you know, uh, there was no place to have a smudge within most of the facilities. But, you know, in the last 10 years, I, I've seen a lot of change in that where now there are even, you know, rooms that have been, you know, sort of ventilation systems modified within hospitals or within universities where those kinds of things can happen. You know, before it was that 
you know, you, you couldn't do that. You know, the answer would be like, no, the fire marshal said no or something, right? Or it's going to set off the water, the, the smoke alarms. Um, so a lot of those things, you know, were really practical. Another one was that we used to have to have like a, like a two week notice for a smudge because of like workplace safety and health, healthy workplace stuff. So similar to like, it, it was sort of considered that a cultural practice or a ceremony was, you know, akin to someone wearing a really, really uh, sort of fragrant perfume or something, right? That there might be others with allergies or things. And, and those are valid, you know, issues for people in their workspace. But again, you know, a lot of the practical work that, that was needed, um, you know, has been, has been fixed. Um, the other places where, you know, just including elders, including, you know, cultural people, um, providing honorariums, you know, a lot of this work was just, it was practical, it was difficult. Finance departments would say, well, no, you can't just, you know, you, you know, REBs would say, well, no, you know, they got to sign something. And, and that's all, you know, changed at least in my institution. So, you know, there's still, there's still places where those things can improve, uh, but we're taking care of a lot of the practical things. The, the, the next part is, is, you know, in just in, in, in where is the place for that? And, and, and how do we, um, how do we continue to kind of, um, include those things where, um, and include them in a meaningful way, right? So I think that, you know, I've certainly been involved in, in projects, uh, my own and others, where, you know, there was great engagement by, you know, elders, cultural people. I've seen ones where, you know, there, there, was, there was some engagement, but it was, you know, it wasn't as easy for elders to engage, um, just given the nature uh, of, of how things were structured or whatever. So I, I think, like, you know, it, it can really, really vary the emails and, and, and things I get asked now are, are always, you know, are, are, are very, very typically quite specific questions from other places in the country, like, how would you do this? And, and my answer always is, is well, you, you've got to talk to your partners and your elders, like, how would you do this? So the way that we might do that here or provide an honorarium or what the value of that would be or how much time we'd ask or specifically what we'd be doing, like, those are all, you know, subject to, you know, the, 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 the culture and, and norms. Uh, here uh, and I, I can't speak for, you know, Rod in in Kamloops. I can't speak for you know other people in other places, except for that it, that it's a, it's a process and you you have to have to have a relationship and, and trust that process and it just and then and then when the university uh, doesn't want you to do that, you have to fight it until it does um, or have your supervisor do that. So, you know, and I think that there's a responsiveness from institutions now that. Um, that at least in my in my case, that uh, perhaps wasn't always there, um, even though it can still be tough. Um, and, and the idea is is that those that came before me, you know, had a had a hard go of it, and I certainly had a hard go at times. And then you know, and, but each 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 academic generation, which isn't very long, um, hopefully is moving that forward such that uh, uh, trainees that come you know well after us will have a much more uh, uh, just a much more comfortable experience uh, integrating these things. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm so glad we made time for that and you were able to yeah. see. That's really good. And I think uh, I absolutely think that all the hard work that, um, you know, you yourself, previous generations of researchers having to fight and establish those things and, and challenge the kind of construction of things that can limit ceremony rooted in um, either research or practice or in domains of education. It, you know, all that, all that good work lays a beautiful foundation for hopefully a much easier future for us to be able to do that. So thank you very much. Yeah, no, thank you. Absolutely. No, I think, I think we've reached the end of our questions, which is, I think we can begin to wrap up now. So I'm just going to light a little bit more medicine to uh, close us in a spiritual way. I would again like to say thank you so much for, for joining us, taking time out of all the many hats that you wear and all the, all the different things that you do for sharing your work. We, we deeply appreciate it. Um, just a reminder to everyone, and thank you everyone for joining us from wherever you're coming from. Um, please take a moment to fill out the uh, evaluation survey. survey it is in the chat and um, we've reposted it but just uh so we can share all your thoughts and reflections um and hopefully keep uh keep up uh things again in a good way um once again thank you so much dr mushquash um i'm just i've got some more medicine lit for us and just as we offered our thanks and greetings to the four directions to um our our grandmothers our grandfathers um, all the spirits that have joined us, we'd like to uh, thank them for being here, for guiding this work, for gathering us virtually, but in spirit very much together in a good way. 
Um, we'd like to say Jimmy Gwich for all the, the great work that this, um, this wonderful being does and that we are all able to learn in a beautiful way from, from each other and for a beautiful future for our family and for all our relations. Miigwech, 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 miigwech. Okay, thank you everyone for attending. Again, thank you, Dr. Mushkwash and take good care, everybody. Thanks.